Hello, everyone. My name is Katherine Barron. I'm a longtime education reporter and host of The Score, a podcast about academic integrity and cheating. We explore the landscape of cheating in school and delve into the key issues at play in this multifaceted issue challenging academia today. In each episode, we speak with faculty, scholars, or students and ask them to provide insights into what's happening in college and university classrooms and why. How big a problem is it? Who cheats? As well as what policies, regulations, prevention efforts, and changes in teaching and assessment show promise in curbing cheating. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at podcastthescore, that's one word, or stop by our website to download show notes and see our lineup of guests and release dates. Again, that's podcastthescore.com. On this episode of The Score, we're discussing an approach to learning that focuses on enhancing student success and reducing both anxiety around tests and the pressure that drives some students to cheat on exams. It's an online testing system that gives students a lot of flexibility. Each student can choose the best time for them to take the test, day or night, or in many cases, in the middle of the night. That's the simple description of the approach to online examinations at the University of New England in Australia. It also involves creating learning environments that support positive behaviors and the well-being of students. Kylie Day and Sarah Thornycroft are leaders in this field and lead the design and implementation of online examinations at the University of New England. Kylie Day is the manager of exams and e-assessments at UNE, and Sarah Thornycroft is the Director of Digital Education. Kylie and Sarah, welcome to The Score. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you. Before we begin, we'd just like to acknowledge that we are located on the traditional lands of the Anawan people uh, here in Armidale in Australia, uh, and we would like to pay our respects to the Elders past, present and future. Okay, thank you. My first question now is really setting the stage. The University of New England in Australia serves a distinct group of students, and I'm wondering if you can tell us a bit about UNE and who your students are. Sure. So the University of New England has been an online university oh, forever. We've always been a... Online and distance before yeah, that. Yeah, distance distance education university from the beginning back in 1956, Mm. I think. And so our cohort of students are not necessarily the traditional school leaver, full-time student. Our average student is female, 30-something, has children, has a job, has community commitments, caring commitments, employment commitments. And so our students need more flexibility than most. Before we get into the flexibility part of it, because that sounds crucial for that group of students. I thought one of you mentioned in an earlier conversation that in Australia, it's more acceptable to fail. And I'm really interested in knowing more about that, because that's certainly not the way it is here in the United States. And I think that might be because of the financial pressures or the reduction in financial pressures on our domestic students, at least, that we have a Commonwealth-supported program where students can have their tuition fees paid for by the government on a deferred basis. They can get income support. And so that financial pressure to succeed and not have to repeat is much reduced for our domestic cohort. It's probably also worth noting that the provision of funding from the government is an interest-free loan, which is just indexed for inflation, and paying back is deferred until you exceed an income threshold. So the financial pressures to pay back those student loans and the cost of the um, study is quite a different proposition here than it is in the US, as I understand. And Sarah and I were also talking about a, a cultural difference, I suppose, the kind of Australian cultural aspect of not allowing yourself to have a big ego, not taking yourself too seriously. Yeah, tall poppy syndrome <laughs> is a... Um, a bit of a thing. It doesn't apply to all demographics, but it is something that you do see. What is that syndrome? Tall poppy syndrome, dissuading people from excelling too far. Like the idea that it's better to 
remain on par with those around you rather than excelling and distinguishing yourself necessarily. Yeah, that never happens. It's not a unilateral thing, <laughs> but it's a, yeah, it's definitely a flavor. It's just a, yeah, it's a flavor and it's a difference. I was going to say the pressure here with finances is crazy. Our student loans are approaching $2 trillion right now in outstanding loans, which is a hard number to even fathom. It's hard to sustain, isn't it? <laughs> I think so. Tell my daughter <laughs> about that. She feels like she'll yeah. be paying it off for a long time. Now, getting into the flexibility, one goal that we have on the score is to explore ways to reduce the incidence of cheating. And you've both said that being harsh and inflexible when it comes to testing is counterproductive. Kylie, you described it in an earlier conversation as catch and smack. And both yeah. of you have said, that, yeah, I know, I like that, have said that academic integrity is about risk-taking behavior, essentially, you know, what are the chances that I'll get caught? And so with the flexibility that you have in testing at UNE, what's the process? How does it work? I think first to understand it, we need to think about why we do this. I suppose the philosophy behind this crazy thing we do. Um, and that's that I think students decide to cheat before they ever get into the exam. And if all of the effort is focused on what happens in the exam, it becomes quite harsh and stressful. You know, really, what's the word I'm looking for, Sarah? It's like focused on policing the transaction in situ in the exam mm. rather than focusing on the context around the student as a whole. Yeah. So. If we put our effort towards the students' feelings and attitudes and decisions before the exam ever starts, so in the same way as a community safety program or a community health program, you would, you know, do population-wide communications to talk about the risks involved, expected behaviour, alternatives to risky behaviour. In the same way that the highway patrol police are not expected to catch every single person who might speed, they have a presence and that serves a, a purpose to make it risky um, to dissuade people from speeding. But that's not the only thing that one would do if, if you wanted to reduce, say, the road toll or the incidence of people breaking the road rules. You would expect to have a community safety program and, and narrative happening along with that. Um, and, you know, when we catch people who might be cheating, it's not a good outcome for them. It's not a good outcome for us as an institution. So our efforts have to be well before the actual exam on the day. And the harsher we get about exam management, exam rules, the more stress we add to that interaction with our students. Is that the catch and smack approach? Yeah, the catch and smack that you wait until, you know, you lie in wait. It's like a hunting game. <laughs> you lie in wait and you catch them and you punish them. And that in itself is not going to stop cheating. Mm. It's an indication that you are still creating situations as an institution where students feel like that is the the best option for them. Yeah, Reframing from catching cheating to understanding cheating is important, I think. And I know we'll talk about risk-taking a bit later on as well, but just to build on what Kylie said, I think the notion of cheating as risk-taking behaviour, it's important to understand the decision-making and like the cost-benefit analysis that students do that end up with cheating being the least risky option. The other options actually present more risk. There might be risks to people's sense of self or their interpersonal relationships or all manner of things that lead to the choice of cheating as a less risky option, which seems counterintuitive. Uh, the example of how flexibility can prevent cheating, a person in an insecure employment situation, so a casual worker might get extra shifts, you know, that means they can pay the rent, but they also have an assignment due in a week. They can choose between paying the rent, not paying the rent, getting their assignment done, failing or cheating, none of those options are very pleasant, or they can get an extension. 
um, on that assignment. So we see flexibility and easy flexibility as a key factor in letting students manage their own pressures in ways that allows them to succeed and not have to cheat to do that. It changes the cost benefit analysis. So we work with online exam proctoring service where our exams live in our learning management system, but we have highly skilled and trained supervisors who can, they have a view of the student's screen. They can use software to lock down that student's computer in ways that we ask them to, and they can also watch the student. And through that, we can allow what we call an availability window. So we can say our default is that exams are all available for 24 hours. The duration is still the same once that student starts the exam, but they can choose to do the exam after they've dropped the kids off to school or after work or before work, or I'm an evening person, not a morning person, so I'll do mine at 10 o'clock at night rather than nine o'clock in the morning when I, you know, coffee hasn't actually kicked in yet. So students really like that and they can choose a time of day that suits them around their other commitments. A lot of our exams are, have availability windows of up to two weeks, which means that almost all students can find a time that, where they can actually do the exam and we don't get many students say, for those exams where they can't find, you know, they can't find a way to make themselves available. So in spite of all of their commitments, they can still be available to the, for the exam. What about during that two-week period, if a student talks to another student in the class and asks about the test? And that's the first thing that our faculty said when we started having conversations mm -hmm. about flexibility. Flexibility is an F word, if I can be <laughs> cheeky. <laughs> Students will cheat. And so that's when we talk about design. The assessment needs to be designed in the mode or in the context of the mode that it's held. It should not be that we're just doing paper exams on a web page. It's a whole second order change. So the design features might include using a question bank. So you would have just enough, you know, I get a different question one to you. It's still the same topic, same degree of difficulty, but if I say, hey, what did you put on question one, that kind of collaboration will be disrupted because we get different question ones. Having exams built on the standard quiz tools in the learning management system really enables that because there's all sorts of options that you can draw on around question banks, randomization that can assist design that is more robust in avoiding academic integrity or minimising academic integrity risks vis-a-vis -vis flexibility. And it depends on what you're trying to achieve with your assessment. I, I think that this change that we've um, gone through has really focused attention on assessment design and really forced people to think about what they're trying to achieve with their assessment. You know, when you think about an assignment, everyone has the same question. They get it weeks in advance. And that's not seen as anything to worry about because the assignment design embraces that, expects students are going to look at other sources and says, you have to cite your sources correctly. So it's embracing those assessment conditions and making them part of the assessment. With exams with long windows, one of the other design features could be you need to really demonstrate a really deep understanding of the topic and that if you don't have a deep understanding in the exam conditions, we know that it's coming from your brain because we've checked your identity. We know that you're not referring to other things necessarily or getting help. So it's coming out of your brain. And if I don't have a deep understanding of tax law, knowing the question an hour beforehand is not going to help me have a deep understanding of tax law. If it was really in, you know, a lower order of thinking, so recall, um, define that kind of question, I might be able to look it up and recall it later. But if it's, you know, evaluate or analyse a case study or build on previous work that have been in previous assessments, then it will be really hard to get any benefit from an earlier knowledge of a question, I think. 
Now, if a student knows that that there's somebody watching them while they're taking the test, wouldn't that add another level of anxiety to it? This is where it's really useful to help people make comparisons between the paper examination paradigm in which somebody is watching them and often in more embodied ways of, you know, walking up and down and patrolling the physical room that people are located in. Um, but we've also discovered because online the proctor and student relationship is one-to-one, whereas in an exam hall it's one-to-many. Yes, that proctor is watching because that's the cultural condition for examinations that we've agreed on regardless of when they're held. But the proctor can actually also provide support in situ, which can be both technical support or general encouragement. And we've had a lot of comments come through student evaluation that actually talk about how helpful and supportive the proctor was. So that's one of the key reasons that we focus on human invigilation, um, not AI only invigilation, because of that personalized element and the ability to also provide benefits, not just stress and monitoring. So in invigilation in our country, that's proctoring, right? <laughs> oh, sorry. Yes, it's, yeah. yes, it's all the same thing. So what, what, what might a proctor say other than a technical thing? Like if somebody's like sweating and pulling their hair out, might they say, take a deep breath, you know? They this. do. And they'll say, you know, do you need to take a break before we start? Are you ready to start? If they're really distressed or having any issues or disagreements about the permitted materials or the content, or there's a major technical issue, uh, we're on call to our proctoring service. So they can directly contact us up until 1am each evening during our peak exam periods so that we are on hand to resolve any drama. And that's because if we say to students, you can sit your exams at, you know, in the middle of the night, we want to provide support for that and not just leave them hanging. And that's one of the one of the anxieties that come through from students is, you know, that means if I'm sitting at home, the proctor or the supervisor is in another country even, they're not in the same room. What happens if something goes wrong? What help is there for me? And our point is that there's lots of help. They can contact us in real time. The supervisor, proctor will contact us in real time if there are any issues. And when a student does show signs of distress, the proctors are really professional and have had a lot of training and they will, you know, care for the student as much as they can. Have you found that because students are more relaxed that they're doing better on the exams? We do have some metrics uh, from a professor who created an, an exam on demand where all of the assessments were, you know, gatewayed. So you had to pass to get to the next one. And if you failed, then there was a, you know, another way that you could get back on track. And if you completed all of those assessments, then you could access the exam. And that could be whenever you were ready for the whole teaching period. So we had in our, what, 12-week teaching period, we had students sitting the exam in week five. And that was because that worked for them, you know, instead of the drip feed of I have to tune in for three hours per week to keep up with what's going on. How about I just take three weeks off work? I get it all done and I, I've done that whole subject. So that works for some of our students. And when he did that, he could show that, you know, the, the average grade in his class was on a slow decline over many years because it was first year accounting, right? And he realised he had a lot of students from lots of different backgrounds, lots of different abilities and experiences, and he wanted to find a way to help that whole cohort do well. And he brought in a lot of flexibility and feedback. And immediately that he brought in these changes, you could see the trajectory lift up again. And he was also able to show that it wasn't because all this flexibility means people cheat and that's why they're getting higher grades. We very early on had um, a lot of our professors paying attention to that and they showed us that students weren't achieving any differently to how they were expected to achieve as individuals based on their other assessments um, and that there were no concerning trends 
in the results other than people were actually able to access the assessment, the exam, because of the flexibility and they were able to complete it rather than having to ask for what we call a deferred exam because they weren't available. In terms of um, overall data, like it's a tricky one to disambiguate all of the contributing factors around performance to the exam experience specifically, but there are, I mean, there's plenty of theories around that explain it. So Csikszentmihalyi's uh, flow theory, for instance, does make it very clear that there's a correlation between anxiety and performance in any activity. But also the grade's only part of the conversation. You know, if a student's performance stays the same, but their experience improves, that's significant. What time of day is most popular? We schedule the exam. So we have a start time for each window and they do cluster around that. But what we find is that afternoon and early evening are very popular times for people. So childcare's sorted, work might be sorted, all of the day-to-day, you know, tasks might be sorted, but definitely afternoon and early evening. Correct me if I'm very wrong too, there's also a spike around um, nine o'clock, which is after school drop-off time. Mm -hmm. Now, how many students can take the test at once? Because I'm wondering if bandwidth is a problem when you have so many thousands of students. Our provider probably supervises about one and a half to two million exams per year. Um, so we are not even a blip on their horizon, really. We talk to them regularly about our requirements and their resourcing. And we haven't really had an issue except in 2020 when they had to suddenly grow because half of the universities in the world were knocking on their door saying, can you do my exams too, all of a sudden. So we did have capacity issues then, but we don't anymore. There's there's really no limit because we have the availability window. So we don't have 1,000 students all starting at the same minute like you would in a paper exam situation. Our provider makes appointments available based on their resourcing capacity and then students go and book into one of those appointments. So they tend to match, you know, our, our student requirements match their resourcing capacity through that appointment system. As with other platforms, should we need a significantly high number of current users, that's, um, we have requirements that are covered by service level agreements with vendors. So, Do you have online practice exams for, to help students as well? I, I thought I had read that. We do. And that's one of our favorite things. Uh, we call it a try it out exam. And it you have to book it. It's supervised. You have to follow the rules. But it's got questions like, you know, hey, did you know this is where you can see the countdown clock on your screen? Or a question that suggests that you change the batteries in your wireless mouse or keyboard before your exam and do all your Windows updates. It's It's instructional around how do I have a good time in my online exam? It has a thing on, you know, create a... Draw us a graph, which you can do, showing the correlation between the amount of caffeine that you consume compared (laughs) to the amount of assignments you have due. So it's intentionally lighthearted, but it allows a student to work out, you know, what buttons do I have to push? How does this thing work out? What does it feel like? What does it look like? What do I need to do in my own space to conform to exam conditions? And will my computer actually sustain the technical requirements and the bandwidth that I need. And we ask students to do that very early. It's free. All of our exams are free, but that one is free for them to do as often as they like, whenever they like, and we encourage them to do it early so that they can then contact us and say, hey, I've got an issue with this aspect of my online exam. What do I do? They have time to resolve that instead of trying to work out what button to push when your exam should have started 10 minutes ago. That's what we want to avoid. We want to separate tech anxiety from exam anxiety. And I think in an earlier conversation, I said that, you know, you can weld with that kind of white hot anxiety when you combine the two. So we we go to great effort to separate them. There was something that interested me. I, I was looking online 
and there's a short video that talks about how to set up your exam space. And then there's also a graphic that reads, keep calm and call the exams team. When would students do that? What kinds of calls do you get? What kind of information are they looking for? That is something that we brought in only, what, four or five months ago, yeah, I think. The year. Yeah, because it became clear to me that the students that, that come through to me during the exam period are the ones that are in a world of pain and my staff are having trouble assisting them and so they put them through to me. And so I work out whatever issue it is and, and a solution very calmly. And, I, and I've started saying to them, if you knew that we could help you in this way, you know, an hour ago when the issue first emerged, would you have been so stressed and so upset as you were when you first came through to me? And without fail, they all said, actually, no. If I knew that you could help me this way, I would not have been stressed at all. I would have just called you. So we started just putting this message out, just keep calm and call the exams team because we can help. We can give real help in real time. If a student loses time because, you know, their computer decides to start their Windows update halfway through their exam or their, their webcam disconnects or whatever it is, our um, proctoring provider provides free tech support. And when they finish dealing with that, they also have a student advocate system where those student advocates will contact us according to our instructions and say, hey, this person, they lost 15 minutes in their exam because of this issue. And we are ready to respond in real time to say, sure, I've just logged into our learning management system. I've given them that time back in real time. So we can recompense lost time we can resolve any access issues that a student might have. Or we can advise on, you know, if they just can't get in on the day because their internet is just a bit off that day, we can talk to them about other options. So an alternative form of assessment or a deferred exam or a reschedule. So they are options beyond a technical solution that we can say, how about tomorrow? How do you get the word out to students? How widespread is this campaign? We communicate to every student that has an exam, every teaching period in four different ways during that teaching period. So the first one is, hey, here's your exam timetable. Go and have a look. By the way, here's what you need to do to prepare. Go and do your try it out exam and keep calm and call the exams team. And then when we've built the exam and made it bookable, we send them another message through the learning management system to say, hey, go and book. Do you try it out exam if you haven't already done it? And if you've got issues, keep calm and call the exams team. Then we have a couple of reminders after that. But we also work closely with our social media team and with our counselling service. And our counselling service really love that partnership where they can say to students, you know, you have agency you can check if it's going to work. You can get a feel for it beforehand. You can call people who can help you. And just to unpick that internal dialogue that happens in people's heads where people say to themselves, that's it, the sky is falling in. I'm going to get an automatic fail. I can't do anything about it. No one can help me. The sky is falling in to, oh, I got that phone number. I saw a phone number somewhere. I'll go and get it and I'll call someone. They can help me. It's okay. It's not just for uh, students either, uh, it's also for staff. And we share that messaging through our, we have uh, internal communications for staff, so a blog and a newsletter, for instance. Kylie also has it in her email signature. So anytime she's communicating with staff, it's just kind of seeding that. Posters printed around the place. It's just making sure that that message is just kind of becomes part of our landscape. Yes, and not perpetuating the myth. So we've spoken to our like customer service call centre people and our social media team who we had noticed had been in the habit of sending out posts like, you know, it's exam time soon and we know you're really stressed, so, you know, and we made contact and said, would you please not do that? Like, please stop framing exams as being stressful things. 
How about, hey, it's exam time soon and we wanted to check in to see if you've done your tried out exam because that can help you have a good time. And here's a phone number if you need to talk to someone because that can help you have a good time. Um, and just not perpetuating that myth that exams must be stressful. So you had to change a lot of cultures throughout the university. <laughs> Yes. How long did this take? And, and, <laughs> and, you know, how did, what worked the most to, to bring everyone together? What rings in my head a lot is the phrase demonstration beats explanation. So just starting with people who wanted to come and play, really, and making sure that went really well. Those people then become champions. You can publicize details and say, you know what, we can talk all we like, but we tried it and this is what happened. And having evidence to show people. Mm. That's a, um, a key role that I see for myself as leadership as well, is that kind of demonstration or modelling in making sure that when I'm in spaces with faculty, with other leadership, um, modelling that there's another way to think about exams, there's different rhetoric that we can share. There's different ways that we can talk and think about this phenomenon that aren't just stress, negative negativity, cheating, privacy, and actually using the ways that I talk and frame things and the communications that we put out to reframe that, that thinking. Have you heard from other universities around the world who have read about what you're doing? We have, um, during 2020, pr probably more than half of the universities in Australia made contact just to say, hey, we hear you've been doing this for a while. Tell us what you've learned because we're in the middle of it right now. So we've had a lot of contact with other universities in Australia at least. Mm. It's still reasonably frequent that we will get um, contact from other universities just drawing on our experience and uh, as advice, as picking our brains, uh, support, um, you know, understanding the wider phenomenon. So I know that I've had a lot of conversations with uh, people across the sector around our like our organisational context and the cultural piece, the change piece around actually how do you make this thing work? How do you engage people? What are the concrete steps that these other universities can take? One of the pieces of advice I give to people at other universities is that they should not consider it to be an IT project, nor should it be seen as a like admin logistics project, that those pieces are really important. But the structure of the team is, I think, is one of the reasons for our success in doing it. Yeah. I think I tend to um, frustrate my sector colleagues who kind of hope that there might be a a nice recipe of concrete steps and you just follow the steps and then it works and it's all good. And they come and talk to us and we're like, oh, actually it's a, a cultural change piece. And so you have to learn how to have hard conversations with staff and you have to like change the culture in your teams and you have to poke people's mental models. And they're like, that's not concrete steps. <laughs> <laughs> do you have the manual yet? <laughs> no. I mean, internally to our team, we do a lot of work on developing people's capabilities around you know, change work and interpersonal communication and the ways that we can work more effectively to engage people and change culture. But yeah, it's not fast and it's not easy. Probably a concrete step is resourcing those conversations. Um, another concrete thing you can do is um, just around choosing the language that you use and the, the um, types of things you choose to communicate. You know, so you can in staff communications you can choose you know what bits of data you want to highlight to achieve what what outcomes you can choose the words that you use when you're creating these communications that will potentially influence how people think those are concrete things that you can do but they're not easy concrete things <laughs> have you heard from any of the universities or colleges in the united states not especially. We know about what other universities in the US are doing through our supervision provider, but we haven't really had it much contact from institutions in the US, other than the other University of New England. 
<laughs> we sometimes get their bills. <laughs> <laughs> Kylie and Sarah, thank you so much for joining us on this episode of The Score. Kylie Day is the Manager of Exams and E-Assessment at the University of New England in Australia, and Sarah Thornycroft is the Director of Digital Education. Join us next time on The Score, where you can listen to a supplementary episode with Day and Thornycroft as they explain the organizational structure of their online exam program, how they use data to inform instruction, and more about the culture of assessment practice and operations at UNE. You've been listening to The Score. I'm Katherine Barron.